Anyada, welcome to SFU lecture series on Aboriginal issues. We would first like to acknowledge ourselves as visitors to the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations on whose land the, the SFU campuses resides, and extend our appreciation and for the opportunity to live and learn on their territory. Izia, my name is Klahani Arorik. I am from the Tiskia Crow clan. I'm from the Talton Nation. I work here at Simon Fraser University for the Office for Aboriginal Peoples. These series are brought to you by UBC, SFU, co-hosted by the Indigenous Research Institute here at SFU, and SFU Woodward's building, supported by SFU Van City Office Community of Engagement, also supported by our office, Office, of, office for Aboriginal Peoples. Tonight's lecture is, is by Dr. Krish, I knew I'd, Kr, Krishna Pendekar, Professor of Economics here at SFU. He will be presenting his lecture tonight on the Aboriginal people in Canada's labour market, Aboriginal incomes of 19, from 1990 to 2005. He was the co-director of Metropolis's British, British Columbia, Center of Excellence for Research on Immigration and Diversity from 2007 to 2013. It was an inter, interdisciplinary policy research center which connected approximately 100 academic researchers with more than 100 policy interested people in government and NGO communities. They engaged in the support of research, training, dissemination of knowledge with a total funding of 500,000 per year in the nine federal departments, the Ministry of Education, Labor Market Development of British Columbia and their host universities, SFU and UBC. Isini, all my relations, Matthew, Dr. Kitchener, Pendekar. So, um, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, so, the work I'm going to talk to you about is work that I've done with my brother, Ravi Pendekar, who's at the University of Ottawa. And uh, as you can see, uh, I started with his, uh, his slides. So, uh, we've got this University of Ottawa logo, which makes it all the more national and classy, I think. Um, so, uh, Ravi and I have been working on trying to characterize and understand inter-ethnic disparity in Canada for the last 20 years. And um, the, I, and we've written lots and lots of papers on this crap. And uh, the first paper we wrote was called The Color of Money, which I think was a, a real coup in titling. And, uh, and it was published in the Canadian Journal of Economics. And it was the first paper I ever published. Um, and it presented. Uh, findings from 1990 data, uh, 1990 data on people's incomes and uh, just asked, uh, you know, is there any much difference between visible minority, Aboriginal and immigrant incomes in Canada? And uh, this, at the time, this was a long time ago, but at the time, literally nothing was known about this for Canada. And there were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers on uh, black people in the United States, because people cared about black people in the United States, and uh, tons of papers on immigrants in the U.S., and because uh, and people cared about that, but there was literally nothing for Canada. And so my brother, who worked for the federal government at the time, I was in graduate school at Berkeley, phoned me up and said, uh, well, you know, do non-white people make less money in Canada like they do in the U.S.? Is it as bad? Is it better? And I kind of poked around through books and physical journals, because those were the days. And, uh, and the answer was, I don't know. We don't know. So uh, we decided we needed to find out. And uh, when we did find out, we were, we were pretty shocked, um, kind of in two directions. Um, my brother is seven years older than me. He's uh, 53. I'm 46. We, we grew up in Vancouver. And um, we grew up in Carisdale, which was 150% uh, white at the time. And um, we went to Point Grey High School, which was 150% white at the time. And uh, my brother's experience of growing up, he's just seven years older than me, but his experience of growing up 
um, in Carisdale at that time was that it was a cesspit of seething racism. Um, and my experience was, yeah, who can even tell? So, you know, a lot changed in the 70s, and my expectation was that looking in the data, you know, so long later, this was 1990 data, my, ex my expectation was that we'd see, you know, pretty much nothing among Canadian-born people in terms of differences in labor market attainments, and, and probably something between immigrants and Canadian-born people. So this is, this is a table that just has the average earnings uh, from wages and salaries of men. I'm going to talk about men and women later, but I'm just starting with, I don't really know how much math you guys have, so I'm just starting with just the average earnings of the white Canadian-born people in the upper left, 34000 pathetic $1990. Um, and uh, visible minority men, 31000 So it's a little less. It's like 10% less. And, uh, and then if you look over at the immigrants, white immigrants, actually white immigrants earn on average more than do white Canadian-born men at that time. And, Visible minority immigrants earned a little less than did visible minority Canadian-born men, um, and kind of a lot less than uh, white Canadian-born men. But if you go down to the bottom there, Aboriginal men had average earnings of uh, $25,000, which is like a lot less. Um, because I'm going to be showing you numbers and pictures from, huh, come closer. No, that's all right. I can, I can do my own clicking. Uh, I, I, I want to express it in percentages, uh, just to get used to expressing things in percentages. So, um, so this, is the, this is the same data, but here I'm just expressing it as proportional differences. So proportional with respect to what? Well, compared to Canadian-born whites, so there's just a dot, dot there. Um, and you see that visible minority... Uh, men have an average percentage earnings gap, uh, Canadian-born ones, of 15%. Immigrants, a little lower, an average gap of 18%. And Aboriginals, an average gap of 45%. So that is a really big number. The, th the thing is, and th this, is, this is kind of an important the thing, when people look at a number like that, uh, it's very easy to say to yourself, oh, well, gosh, you know, I've heard all these terrible things about Aboriginal people's educational attainment. Everybody knows education is how you make the money. They don't have the education, they don't make the money. Okay, so, um, and that's, I mean, it's true that education is, is how you make the money. It's true that Aboriginal people uh, have lower levels of education than do non-Aboriginal people. And indeed, the, it, it's a lot lower. So high school completion rates are on the order of 55%, which is very much lower than the 85% for the non-Aboriginal population. Um, you know, these are, it's really true. However, um, you can ask this same kind of question. You can, that, that takes into account those differences. So, um, so the, the basic issue is that, you know, Aboriginal, you know, when you're thinking about earnings, when you're thinking about the income we can make in society, there's two really important things that, that determine your income. One is age, old people have more money. Um, and the other is education. Educated people have, have, you know, make more money. Aboriginal people are both younger and less educated than our non-Aboriginal people, and you, you want to take that into account. So from this point forward, I'm going to make all statements of income, comparis income comparisons in a way that says, well, for people who have the same education and income level, what then is the disparity that we can lay on um, minority status or Aboriginal status. So, um, so here's the, the, the little table at the bottom is those numbers. So uh, you see that um, visible minorities uh, have earning, Canadian-born visible minorities have earnings that are 10% less than those of Canadian-born white people, and Aboriginal people about, you know, about a third less. So this is now, this is the answer to, if you look at this table, which is just raw differences, and you say, oh, well, come on, Aboriginal people are, are you know, 45% is terrible, but then they're so young and there's not so much education. This is the comeback. 
This says that if you look at Aboriginal, and this, is, this again is just 1990, if you look at uh, Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal men uh, and ask, well, if we just consider Aboriginal men who have the same age and education, and actually we control for a bunch of other stuff, but age and education are the, are the main things. If you, if you keep, hold those constant and ask, well, if I just look within high school educated, you know, 30 year olds, is there, is there still a difference in earnings attainment between Aboriginal and, and uh, white men? The answer is yes, it's about 33%. Okay, so, um, so there, there, I mean, this is just a very small amount of information I've given you, but the thing that uh, really struck Ravi and I, I mean, at the time we were interested in inter-ethnic disparity broadly, and we were interested in immigration issues, and we've written, you know, many, many papers on uh, immigration and integration and this kind of thing. But the thing that really jumps out at you here is that Aboriginal disparity is, is just way more severe uh, than any other inter-ethnic disparity that we have in the Canadian mosaic. Um, it's comparable to uh, black male wage differentials in the U.S. in 1950, right? So it, it's um, just way more severe. Uh, it's not accounted for by lower education levels. So, I mean, and of course, the lower education levels are piled on top of this disparity. Okay, so um, it's also the case that Aboriginal people are a very large chunk of Canada. It's 5% of the population. They're growing fast because they have birth, uh, Aboriginal people's birth rates are uh, just a little under twice the birth rates of non-Aboriginal people. So it's a large population growing fast uh, really severe levels of economic disparity. So, you know, and once you see a number like one-third lower and you're worried about kind of inequality, it's hard to sort of get all worked up about any other sort of inequality. This is the major inequality that we face in Canada, um, particularly over the next um, 20, 30 years. So, um, I want to, uh, what I want to do over the next just little bit of time, I'm, you know, don't want to waste, you know, time is precious. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, a paper that Ravi and I wrote re more recently, much more recently, called Aboriginal Income Disparity. It's in Canadian Public Policy if you want the whole thing. It's on my website if you want to double click something. Um, and we use, uh, uh, three census files from the 96, 01, and 06 censuses. Oh, yes. We used to have censuses. I don't know if you're familiar with this thing that happened, but the Tories, um, because they're against knowledge, um, killed off the mandatory long-form census. Uh, the mandatory long-form census is the way we can gather uh, vaguely accurate uh, information about Aboriginal people. Um, and um, so now we can't. There you go. Uh, but, you know, maybe it'll come back. Uh, probably won't, though, because when they ran... The, so I'm just going to complain a, just a little bit, okay? Because they ran the 2011 National Household Survey instead of the mandatory long-form census. Um, the mandatory long-form census would have gone out to... Um, uh, about four and a half million households. They sent the National uh, Household Survey to five and a half million households because they thought, oh, maybe everyone won't respond since it's not mandatory. Um, they got a response rate of 63%, so they spent more money than on the long-form census, got less responses, and since we don't really know who didn't respond, got garbage responses. So it was a very expensive craziness. Anyway, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, I'm going to give you more numbers like the numbers we just saw, this kind of what's the average difference in earnings and income for Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal people um, controlling for age and education, the two most important uh, determinants of incomes. And uh, I'm going to talk about what I mean by Aboriginal and, uh, and minority in, in just a minute. Um, we can talk about variation in this kind of disparity as we look in different cities, because another thing that uh, people often, you know, uh, it is the case that Aboriginal people, 
live more in more remote places than do non-Aboriginal people. It's true, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true too. But like 80% of non-Aboriginal people are urban. Oh yeah, five big cities. Uh, yeah, but 56% of Canadians live in the five largest CMAs, right? So, so the point is that Aboriginal people are uh, less urban than our non-Aboriginal people, and urban people make all the money. So, um, so the way I want to address this issue of, well, is this about remoteness, is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get you to focus like a laser beam on particular urban areas, um, and we'll see if, uh, if it's all an illusion, if it goes away once you just look in within urban areas. Doesn't. Uh, I'm going to look at variation over time. I'm going to give you pictures to look at that trace the evolution of this disparity over 95, uh, 2000, and 2005. The reason I, the reason it's 95 for the incomes and 96 for the census is the census asks you what what happened last year. So um, I'm also going to talk about the. Because education is, is uh, thought to be an important part of this, of course it is, uh, I'm going to talk about the returns to education for Aboriginal people in comparison to the returns of education for non-Aboriginal people, see if there's some difference there that can explain what's going on. Nope. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, glass ceilings and sticky floors, and then we'll tie it up. So that's, that's where we're going. Please feel free to interrupt me. You know, if you want. So, uh, who's an Aboriginal? Well, that's a hard question in reality. It's an easy question in the data. Um, so, there are three questions in the mandatory long form censuses that uh, relate to this. Um, uh, they are, um, well, the narrowest. That is, the, the question to which the fewest people answer yes is, are you a treaty Indian as defined by the Indian Act? Uh, that's about 600,000 people. Okay. So that's, that's the narrowest um, uh, definition or, or classification. And we're going to call those guys registered. And uh, there are two kinds of registers that we can distinguish in these data. There's registered Indians living on reserve and registered Indians living off reserve. I'm going to kind of think of those as separate groups and ask whether there's some important differences across those groups. Um, then there's um, the identity question. Just pretty much asks you to tick a box if you think you're Aboriginal. Is this person an Aboriginal person? So it's hard to know what that, what's going through people's head when they tick or don't tick that box. But nonetheless, that's there. And so uh, for people who are not registered, we can now ask, well, they're not registered, but they, did they tick the identity question? Did they tick off the Aboriginal identity box? And if they did, we'll call them uh, Aboriginal identity. And we're going to divide those guys up because the box comes with uh, North American Indian, Métis, Eskimo, Inuit. And you can t tick multiples. You could be all of them, possibly. No, um, you know, it's possible. Um, and uh, the way we classify there is if you, there, there are, there's hardly anybody who ticks um, uh, Inuit with something else. So we basically take the, if you tick Métis at all, we're going to call you a Métis. If you tick Inuit at all, we're going to call you an Inuit. And uh, if you tick North American Indian, or if you tick North American Indian and something else, we're going to call you North American Indian. So uh, that's that. But then there's yet another question that relates to this kind of thing, and that is the ethnic origin question, and that is, uh, what are the ethnic or cultural origins of this person's ancestors? And they actually define ancestor. They, they have a little parenthetical in the question. They say, uh, where did their parents and grandparents uh, come from, or what were their cultural or ethnic origins? This is a write-in, so people write down their, their answers. And um, there were like 300 uh, different uh, bands and nations and, and ethnic identities that were Aboriginal identities that were written down. And, and then so we ask, well, if you didn't tick off that you're registered and you didn't tick off identity, you may still have uh, ticked off that you have Aboriginal ancestry. And so we're going to divide those into single and multiple Aboriginal ancestries. So these are exclusive categories of 
Aboriginal-ishness. Okay. Um, and, you know, this is what the data allow you to classify. It. So this is the classification we used. Um, then, uh, in order to do this thing, this thing of holding constant age and education and asking, well, among people who have the same age and education level, uh, to, uh, you know, what is the amount of disparity within that group, we use uh, a tool called regression analysis. And indeed, regression analysis allows you to control for m tons of stuff, if you want. And we did one, too. So um, we control for, uh, uh, you know, your, your ancestry. And we're always going to compare people to um, uh, a roll-up of British, French, Canadian ancestry. So um, that's going to be the, the comparison that we're, we're talking about. And we're going to control for um, uh, age and education, as I said. And they're going to be just cut up into cells or, or age groups and education groups. Uh, and we're going to control for where you live, which is the 10 largest CMAs in Canada, plus an indicator that you live in a CMA that's not one of those 10 largest C CMAs, plus um, the possibility that you don't live in a CMA at all. Uh, and then we're going to control for official language knowledge and uh, marital status. Um, because I don't want to, I mean, this, this work is not about immigrants at all, so um, we're just going to use Canadian born people in these comparisons. Just people who are working age, which is 25 to 64, people with positive earnings which actually knocks out a large, large number of Aboriginal people right there because earnings is defined as income that you get from wages and salaries, income from working for somebody else. Uh, about 35% of uh, Aboriginal people have zero income of that type. So when you check out a lot of zeros, it means that the numbers I'm going to give you are conservative in the sense that they are... Uh, smaller amounts of disparity than what's actually going on, uh, but um, uh, so just keep that in mind. To the extent that this is, you know, these numbers are, they, they tell you uh, exactly, you know, the, uh, what I'm saying, but um, they're cautious in this sense. Um, everything is going to be, uh, I'm going to talk about men and women separately, so the comparisons will be like, among men, what is the earnings gap faced by Aboriginals? Among women, what is the earnings gap faced by Aboriginals? So um, comparisons are within sex. Um, yeah, we don't care. Okay. Here's a picture. So uh, this is just for a little bit of a long, long-term context. Uh, this is taken from another paper. Uh, that we have, that I can't remember what it's called nor where it's published, but it's on my website somewhere. Um, so this goes from 1970 to 2005, so we're going way back into much older censuses. Um, and um, it's tracking the relative earnings or the earnings gaps expressed as percentages faced by... Um, male and female visible minorities, and male and female aboriginals. So just uh, if you just look up at the two blue lines at the top, um, the, th those are male and female visible minorities. Um, and then that thick black line near the top, which is zero, is everything would be lying on zero if there were no disparity across ethnic groups, if there was no inter-ethnic uh, earnings disparity, it would all be at zero and, and you know, we'd be happy about it, whatever. Um, so if you look at the, the top, that's visible minority women, and you can see that visible minority women had higher average earnings than did white women uh, in the 70s, um, and, in, and, and that is because they worked more. So basically, uh, you know, White people had these stay-at-home moms or whatever. That used to be a thing. 
Um, and, uh, and visible minorities just really didn't. So that higher earnings. Um, and, uh, but as we move into the post-1980 period, after which uh, labor force participation rates for women uh, got really high and got to be the same for visible minorities and white women, you see that uh, visible minority earnings dropped below, that is, visible minority women's earnings drop below uh, white women's earnings. So, uh, but the gap is small, it's like 5% in recent years. For visible minority men, you see a kind of a similar thing where there's uh, a gap, it's present over in all periods, but it gets bigger. It was kind of five-ish percent up to about 1990, and then it's like 15-ish percent. Um, so uh, that's a thing, and that's a thing that uh, uh, caused Ravi and I some concern. I mean, it seemed like a big deal. Um, the thing is, the numbers for Aboriginal people are such that you kind of look at that visible minority disparity and you kind of start thinking, yeah, whatever. Because if you look at uh, Aboriginal women, their earnings uh, disparity is, is something like 15% throughout the period. And for Aboriginal men, it's um, 40, it's kind of 30 to 40% throughout the period. So, you know, from this point on, I'm just going to focus in these last few years, 95 to 2005, but this is not a recent phenomenon, this enormous degree of Aboriginal disparity. It, it's, it's relevant uh, all the way in the past. Now here the definition of Aboriginal is anybody who fell into any of those categories. Um, I'm going to now uh, try and look within this big group of 5% of the population that is Aboriginal in some way or the other. So this is, uh, as I said, I got two kinds of registered. There's on reserve and off reserve. Then there's North American Indian and Métis. And um, if you want to learn about Inuit, they're in there. But there just aren't that many of them. Um, and then uh, the last category in this picture is uh, Aboriginal ancestry. And it's the multiple ancestry here that's, that's relevant. There are hardly any single ancestry Aboriginal people that did not tick off the identity question as a yes, which suggests that the identity question although it's kind of weird, does actually uh, characterize some, something relevant to Aboriginalness. Um, so uh, the top line is uh, Aboriginal ancestry. So these are, in some sense, these are the least Aboriginal. These are people who have Aboriginal ancestry but did not tick off the identity question. Because when you ask them, are you an Aboriginal person, they say, how? Well, my mother was Cree, but... Um, and uh, they face an earnings gap of about 10%. This uh, gap is a little larger than the earnings gap faced by visible minority women. Right? For them, you're, you may recall it was about 5%, but it's kind of in the ballpark. Okay? Now, if you go down to uh, the other groups in the early part of the period, they all have lower earnings than that least uh, aboriginal group, the aboriginal ancestry group of women. Um, so that's one thing I want to draw your attention to here. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is that there's a lot of convergence over this period. So this is something that uh, my brother is a downer, right? He never guesses that anything's going to be good news. But this, this piece of good news um, is, a, is a lesson that we, we draw from this, this work that we did because this is going to show up a lot. You're going to see this kind of uh, improvement between 95 and 05 um, in many, many of these pictures. Um, the next thing I want you to just kind of notice is the... Um, uh, it's easiest to see in 2000, the two bottom ones are the two registered categories, registered on and off reserve, and they face the largest disparity 
Um, and then the identity groups are in the middle. So this kind of, this, this uh, ordering where the least disparity is faced by the uh, ancestry group and then more disparity faced by the identity groups and more yet faced by the registered groups uh, is another theme. Let me show you men. Now you probably aren't paying attention at this level, but uh, if you look at the scale there, it goes to minus 30. Now it goes to minus 60. Okay, so this is another thing. Like all inequality, there's more of it among men than among women. And Aboriginal inequality, there's more of it among men than among women. Um, so if you look up at the top, you'll see the Aboriginal uh, ancestry group. Again, about a 10% gap faced by these people. This again is the kind of least um, connection to Aboriginal, uh, you know, they're not connected by law, not connected by identity, but are connected by ancestry. Um, and that gap um, is, in, you know, is in the ballpark of what's faced by visible minority men. That was a few slides ago, but that was a 15% gap. Here it's like 8 or 10%. If you look to the bottom two lines, those are the registered on reserve and registered off reserve. And whereas for women, registered on and off reserve women face kind of similar disparity, 20-ish percent, for men, there's a pretty big difference between registered on reserve and registered off reserve. Registered off reserve, on reserve are the most disenfranchised from the labor market. Uh, the earnings gap is half. Have I got it backwards? No. So this is so the question being asked answered here is. Um, how much less does an Aboriginal registered Aboriginal a registered Indian man living on reserve earn than a British origin man? Man, yeah. Uh, yeah, the male female earnings gap uh, currently is on the order of seven percent. So, but if you add a seven to this, it's not doing much. Uh, yeah, uh, but, but I, I, so I don't want to conflate this with a male-female. That's, that's why I do the comparisons. But if you wanted to, um, you, you could ask, well, that's a more complicated question because then you really do want to deal with selection into the labor market, um, which, but anyway, I, I guess the point is, uh, Male-female disparity is very much smaller than Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal disparity. Not when you look at that, right? I mean, this, I mean and this is the lesson that I've learned. I mean, I, I kind of thought visible minority disparity was big because it was, you know, 10 or 15%. But it's just, you know, it hardly shows up on the scale. I mean, you know, uh, so, oh yeah, sorry. So um, you got these two registered categories which have very, very low earnings. And then again, the identity categories are in the middle. Sometimes it's hard to pick this up when you um, look at a, a, a graph. So here are the numbers. It's the same numbers, but this is for um, uh, 2005. This is the last year in the data. Um, and uh, you can see that the two, you know, if you look at men again, the two registered groups have just, you know, very large amounts of disparity, 23 and 48 percent. Um, and the North American Indian and Métis, it's like 18 and 11 percent. And then the ancestry group, it's 6 percent. A lot of the times um, when you're talking about uh, Aboriginal people's labor market attachment and earning and labor market outcomes, you run into... Uh, uh, belief that a lot of people are kind of dimly aware that INAC spends a lot of money. They do spend a lot of money. They, their budget is $12.3 billion a year. And uh, you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, aren't there only 600,000 registered Indians? And isn't that all they're responsible for? Isn't that $20,000 a person? The answer is yes, 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 and yes. Um, and so it's easy to think that, sure, they're not earning it, 
but there must be getting it. So the right-hand column asks not about earnings, but about income. So this is income from any source, but it's the same kind of question. So now I'm going to ask, um, do, uh, what, what is the income gap, total income, all income from any source, including whatever you manage to squeeze out of INAC, which is actually not that much because most of it is indirect. It's not coming to you in the form of cash. It's, 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 it's yeah. Anyway, um, so we can answer the question, uh, you know, if you just looked at income, would much of this disparity disappear? And the answer is no, really not. So if you look at the two registered categories, which is where you would expect this to have an effect, the disparity is actually larger in income uh, for registered on reserve men, but it's of, it's of the same order. It's half, right? It's, and then it's exactly the same, 23% for the registered off reserve. The income gaps for NA, uh, North American Indian and Métis are um, a little larger than are the uh, uh, earnings gaps, but they're not like enormously different. And it's the same for uh, Aboriginal ancestry. So the point here is that um, you don't get much of a, is, the picture is not radically different when you look at income, and income includes um, whatever uh, government transfers uh, these, these folks are getting. So, uh, so that right-hand column is the answer to, but aren't they getting $20,000 each? So uh, now I just want to look uh, across cities uh, and, and kind of directly take on this, um, this belief that because Aboriginal people are less urban than our non-Aboriginal people, and because urban people make all the money, maybe that's the story, and that is not the story. So these uh, bars are um, red is for women and blue is for men. They're, um, they're earnings gaps faced in each place. So these are just, you know, you just cut that city out. You look at the you know, 40 or 50,000 observations you've got in Vancouver and you run the same regression and do it again. And the thing that I would draw your attention to is that zero is here and they're all less, okay? So um, this is not about, um, it's, not, it's not driven purely by remoteness. The other thing to notice is that for most of the cities, you know, for Toronto West, they're, they're big. <laughs> These are big gaps, just like the big gaps that I showed you before. Um, this picture is for registered Indians living off reserve. Um, some of these cities have reserves, right? So Vancouver, uh, Winnipeg, um, you know, have kind of large populations within the census metropolitan areas that live on reserves. And so you can, uh, you can construct the same uh, picture for uh, people living on reserve and, and you, you, you see it again. So it's not about remoteness. There's another, th uh, another thing that uh, comes to mind when you think about different cities, and that is that um, particularly if you come from a, as a background, as I do, of thinking about uh, immigrant disparity and uh, minority disparity more generally, you kind of think, well, are there kind of enclaves? Is it, uh, is it the case that, you know, if they live among many Aboriginal people, things are better? Um, because there is some evidence that um, for some ethnic groups uh, in Canada, if, you, if they live in a place where there are a lot of co-ethnics, uh, their earnings attainment is better. Um, and so the, the classic city here to look at is, is Winnipeg. 11% of the population of Winnipeg is uh, Aboriginal. And uh, the answer is no, it doesn't look like good news there. So um, there's not really an enclave effect one way or the other. Right? It's not that Winnipeg stands out as way worse, nor is it way better. It seems, um, and, and you can more formally do this. And if you do it more formally, it's still not the case. But you kind of get the message from the picture. So another, another, I sound like a bit of a naysayer, right? I mean, I'm, I'm throwing uh, common wisdom out at you and just telling you it's wrong. This is more of that. Um, so one, uh, you know, some level it's kind of a puzzle. Why, why, 
why, do, why is it the case that Aboriginal people have lower educational attainment than do non-Aboriginal people? And one possible answer is, well, it's not worth it, right? I mean, if they, 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 there's no gain, right? I mean, for everyone else, when we model education decisions, we're thinking about what's the gain from education? What's the cost of getting it? Do you get it? And so one reasonable, I don't know if it's exactly reasonable, but one, one claim that, that has been made is that um, for Aboriginal people, there, there's just nothing to be gained from education, in part because of the locations in which they live. Um, but, um, you know, the thing is that's measurable. That's something you can actually just draw a picture of, like this picture. So this picture has education levels, probably too small to read, but they're going from uh, very low levels of education, uh, which it is sad to say are actually relevant for this population. Um, up to various kinds of post-secondary certificates, up to BAs and MAs and PhDs and so forth. And then on the left um, is a function of earnings, but this, this is set up so that uh, you can just think of it as earnings. And the units are set up so that it's measured in proportions, so that it kind of maps into the way I was talking about things before. Um, so these are uh, a sorry earnings education profiles for all these different uh, groups of Aboriginal women, and the point is they all go up. The black line is the same thing for the majority, the British, French, Canadian population that goes up, and you you notice that they go up kind of the sameish, right? It's just kind of the same looking. It's lower. That's because we had there was a bunch of disparity, right? They had lower earnings no matter the education level. This is another way of representing that point, that no matter the education level, the earnings of all those uh, Aboriginal groups are lower. Um, but the other thing that you get from this is that, well, the, you, know, you make more money if you have more education, and that's true for Aboriginal people too, and it's true just as much for Aboriginal people as for non-Aboriginal people. This is the same thing for men. It's easier to see the difference between the black line for the majority population and the lines for the Aboriginal population because the disparity is bigger among men. But again, um, you see, uh, you see, um, you know, a similar upward slopingness. But I would draw your attention to um, see that little dip in the middle. That dip is for uh, uncompleted post-secondary education. So it's like, you know, uncompleted trade certificates and, uh, or post-secondary with no certificate. Um, those guys, that dip is very relevant and is of large magnitude. That's 10 percentage points for Aboriginal people. And uh, there's no dip at all for uh, the majority population. So I think, one thing you might think to yourself is that there, that um, if you go to university and drop out as a non-Aboriginal person, you know, on average, it's like, yeah, whatever. But if you look at the averages for Aboriginal people, the, post -sec the people who do some post-secondary and then drop out um, don't have such good outcomes. So that is a, a difference, and it's a difference that is probably policy-sensitive. We can probably do something about that. So the last thing I want to talk, I think it's the last thing. Actually, I don't know how much. Oh, yes. Last thing I want to talk about is um, glass ceilings. Uh, so this is now, I've now, the, the, the horizontal axis, the vertical axis is still a percent difference. The, the colors of lines are still groups, and I'm looking at women, but the horizontal axis is asking about quantiles of the distribution. So over here, we've got um, uh, Aboriginal people who are at the top part of the earnings distribution for Aboriginal people who at that age and education level. And I want to ask, well, how does their earnings compare to non-Aboriginal people at the top part of their earnings distribution? The point is, if you're an overachiever, um, is this disparity still relevant? And the answer is, well, uh, you know, uh, it's not as bad as uh, if you're at the median. And the median numbers, Q50, look pretty, you know, they're kind of around minus 15 or so. 
Uh, this is in 2000. Um, the median uh, numbers are much like what I told you about before, but at the top of the distribution, um, there's, you know, they're much closer. But at the bottom of the distribution, there's a huge amount of disparity. And so what this, this is saying is that if you're an underachiever, as an Aboriginal person, you get completely screwed. Completely screwed. And the same is true for men, um, that uh, the disparity uh, at the top of the distribution, the overachiever Aboriginal men don't face very much disparity, it's, you know, 10% 10, 10 or so. Um, and the underachievers, those at the bottom of the distribution for whatever their age and education level is, uh, face much larger amounts of disparity. But there's a kind of an interesting thing here that's jumping out. And that is registered Aboriginal, registered Indian men living on reserve. You can, you can be as overachievery as you like. Not going to help. Uh, so, uh, that, you know, this is, this is basically the story uh, I want to tell. Um, so, uh, first thing, that, which just comes from the very first few numbers that I said, still continues to be true, and that is that uh, Aboriginal men and women really face severe earnings income and income disparity relative to majority people. It's, um, it's, it's disparity, you know, for Aboriginal men, it's on the order of 30%. It's, it's similar to the kind of disparity faced by black men in the U.S. in 1950. It's, um, if, you, if you look like a laser beam at registered Indian men living on reserve, the disparity is like 50 or 60 percent. Now we're talking about Canada versus Mexico. I mean, you know, the, so when we, think of, when we think to ourselves that reserves are like other countries uh, in our country, uh, it's worse than that. They're like third world countries in our country. Right? So, um, Identity, there's a lot of variation among Aboriginal people, and the variation that we're able to assess is uh, between people who are registered under the Indian Act, people who are not registered under the Indian Act, but still feel themselves to be in, Aboriginal enough that they tick off a box, um, and then the people who have Aboriginal ancestry but don't tick off the box, and you find that these are ordered, that the most severe disparity is faced by registered Indians, next most is by people with Aboriginal identity and the next most by people with Aboriginal ancestry. Education helps, but it does not overcome this, this disadvantage. It's not the case that we're looking at an environment with, uh, well, if an Aboriginal person just gets a BA, they're, they're done. It's, gonna, uh, it's more like, well, if they get a BA, then they'll be as disadvantaged as any other non-white person. Um, Uh, the disparity is um, uh, got this pattern across the distribution such that the overachievers do face less disparity, but it's not none, and the underachievers get totally hosed. Um, and then if you look across places, you do see this pattern that uh, this is not eaten up by the across place differences in income prospects. It's not that Aboriginal people just happen to live in terrible places, and, and that's the story. It's that not only do they live in terrible places, but even in rich places, they, they don't have uh, as high incomes. But um, I'm just going to uh, go back to the second, this picture right here. This is Aboriginal. This is the, the different groups of Aboriginal men. It's looking at it over time. And what you can see here is an upward slopingness. And that upward slopingness is, it's hard to see because the numbers are so big here, but the magnitude is large. The gains are about 10 percentage points. So that is to say, over this 10 year period, the earnings gap faced by Aboriginal people declined by about 10 percentage points. That's a lot. So something good is going on. We don't know what it is. It's probably not about where Aboriginal people are choosing to live, the amount of education that they're choosing to get, um, uh, but uh, it is happening. So I don't know if it's 
exactly that the future looks good, but I think the present doesn't suck as much as the past. Uh, I'll give you that much. <laughs>